I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is both Saviour and Lord. And I greet you as we begin to get into step and journey with Jesus towards Calvary. I pray that you will enjoy, but also that you'd participate with us this morning as we celebrate our wonderful Saviour. Jesus came into the world not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. In humility, he washed his disciples' feet, leaving us an example of how we should love one another. As we reflect on the love of Jesus, who chose to make himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant and dying on a cross. Lord, help us to follow his example, that he may be exalted in our lives.
we come to a time of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you for the world you have created, for the spectacular spring sunrises, reminding us that the heavens are telling the glory of God. And we thank you for this daily reminder of your power and glory. We thank you too for the attention to detail we see in the carpets of snowdrops along our country lanes and the pops of colour from crocus and daffodils. We thank you that we can trust you as we can trust in the changing seasons. Father, forgive us that mankind has not been kind to our planet, but we pray that new measures to try to redress the balance of nature will help it to begin to recover. We thank you for our families, both near and far, seen and unseen, and for technologies which help us to keep in touch with those far away. Thank you for the skill of scientists and doctors and for the efficiency of the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccinations soon to reach every adult. We pray that this will move us towards a more normal life. Father, at this time of Lent, we thank you for sending Jesus to show us a new way to live. As we think of the days leading up to his death and resurrection, help us to take time out to think of our own lives and to listen to your word for us. We are sorry for the times when life is so hectic that we forget to make time for you and for the things we may have thought, said or done that we shouldn't. Help this time to be an opportunity to refocus on you and your son, Jesus Christ, who is the name above all names. In his precious name. Amen. Let us say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and forever. The reading is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. Jesus predicts his death. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul. 
if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. As we turn to the Word of God, I want to ask you two questions. The first is this, is Jesus out of step with our world? Or is Jesus the way, truth and life and the world is out of step with him? Two questions. 
As we reflect on it, we're going to look at Peter and his response to the gospel. Now, in Scripture, we have four great passages that are called the great. The first is the great commandment where it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength and love your neighbour as you love yourself. The second is the Great Commission where we're sent out into the world to preach the gospel, to make disciples and do the work and follow up the work that Jesus gave us to do. The third one is the Great Confession. And at some point, Jesus asks his disciples, Who do you say I am? In Mark chapter 8, we see Peter answer, You are the Messiah. Just think about that for the moment. Peter becomes the first confessing Christian. You are the Lord. Hopefully, all of you have at some point made that confession. But that's why we call this the great confession. Jesus Christ is Lord. We know that as a fact, but when we say it from our heart, it became, becomes our confession. And the fourth one follows in the next passage of Scripture, which we saw reflected in our reading. It's called the Great Rebuke. And boy, does it sting. And Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan! Whoa! That's a bit harsh. Where's the love, Jesus? But perhaps we need to look deeper at this. It must have really been difficult for Peter to accept that rebuke. It must have been hard, just after his confession of following Christ, to be told he's acting like Satan. But Jesus does rebuke those he loves. He rebukes them to keep them on track. And he knew Peter's nature. He knew Peter was going to struggle to let go of his own selfish thoughts. And to be a Christian means taking the decision to move your own needs, your own desires, your own hopes off the throne and follow the way of Jesus. You see, Jesus had just said that he is going to, at some point, undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day raise again. And that didn't sit well with Peter. He was like, no, 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 that can't happen. That's wrong. There's another way. I'm pretty sure there's... A... I'm not going to let that happen. Think about Peter's story. He continually said that he wouldn't let that happen. He continually said that he wouldn't leave Jesus aside. Even when Jesus was arrested, he cut off the ear of Malchus. He struggled because at the heart of heart, he hadn't surrendered his will to Jesus. And when we are going our own way, and when we're doing it our own way, and we don't surrender our will, then we don't fully understand the beauty of the gospel and the necessity of the great sacrifice on the cross. So let me ask you, what scriptures don't fit well with you? Let's just talk about the Gospels. Because when I read the Gospels, there's some things there that horrify me. Let's pick on four hot potatoes. Sabbath keeping. I don't think we've really got to the gist of Sabbath keeping. Forgiving our enemies. Tithing. Even the Great Commission. Are we seriously going out there and taking the gospel? But you see, we struggle because we are also very worldly. We don't think with the mind of Christ. We think with the mind of the world. 
And Jesus, when he looks at Peter, recognizes he didn't come in to fit in with the world. He describes it as a sinful and adulterous generation. No, he came to forge a different path. A different path that leads to true life. Did he not say in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for through me. And so Jesus knows exactly how to save this adulterous and sinful generation. And he's working his plan. The difficulty is that as Christians, sometimes we like a break on that plan because we refuse to trust Jesus. And so we wonder why our faith has no power when we trust Jesus, when we get him to step with Jesus, when we take him at his word, when we go out and pray and pray for healing and, and preach the gospel, miracles happen. But we need to first surrender our own will to God. When we read scripture, we shouldn't be saying, does this sit well with me? Then I'll follow it. We should be saying, how can I bend my will until it conforms to Christ? If you think about it, a coach is a very important thing. Whether somebody is coaching you in a musical instrument or a sport or even in business. Now, a coach is probably somebody who already knows the answers. A concert pianist is somebody who knows how to play the pieces. For them to teach you, you need to be teachable. And if you're going to continually say, what if we did it this way, and what if we did it that way, and how about this or that, then they're never going to be able to teach you. In the same way, Jesus has left us holy scriptures that are a footpath, a reflection of the way that he came to share, the way that Peter has walked, the way that many others have walked through the ages. Spurgeon and, and, and Paulson and, and John Wesley and, and Barnabas Shaw, who brought the gospel to South Africa for Methodism. They had great power because they learned the principle that Peter started to learn in that moment of the great rebuke. Never, ever try and bend God's will to your own. Rather, learn to bend it. Bend your will to God's. For that is the way, truth, and life. And so, as you go into this week, as you meet as Bible studies or meet with other Christians, ask yourself, what areas am I struggling to let go and let God? What scriptures do I need to wrestle with or stop wrestling with and just start trusting Jesus? In what ways can I get into step with what God is doing through Christ in our world? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and it is hard to be rebuked. And just as Peter must have felt quite kind of put in the spotlight and ashamed, we do too. We get defensive, we get angry, we start to self-justify. But Lord, let us with humility stop and recognize you didn't invite us to share our way, but for us to walk in your way. Help us to get into step with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through his holy scriptures. We pray this in your precious name. Amen.
Yeah, Father God, we seek you now as we bring our prayers for others and for the world. In a time where some say we are entering into a period of irreversible damage to our environment, as oceans rise and land corrodes, erratic weather sweeps our earth, often disproportionately affecting those already living in abject poverty. We seek your conviction amongst nations to stand up for climate issues and to make the changes that are necessary to become good stewards of this earth. And Lord, we lift to you the communities destroyed by natural disasters and conflict and the people, the parents, the grandparents, the children who are displaced from their homes and some never to return again. We lift to you the work of the UNHCR and other organisations as they seek to accommodate refugees in so many different countries. And Lord, we pray for other struggling communities in the world where the COVID-19 effect is felt strongly. We think especially of those who are receiving support from NGOs and charities who are currently unable to resume their work on the ground. Father, we pray for protection of those communities in these troubling times. And we pray too that projects will soon be able to run again to continue their work towards a just world. And Father, now we look closer to home and we think about those people who we know who need your peace and comfort at this time. We lift to you those who are unwell, those preparing for surgery or receiving treatment and for those going through other major life-changing events. We remember Brendan, Sarah McKechnie, Hilda Hewitt, Moira and Laurie Rimmer, Alison McDowell, Brenda and Andrew Judd. We pray also for your comfort for those who are bereaved. That they may know your peace at this time. We pray especially for Martin and Liz Halden on the death of Martin's mum, Thelma, this week. And we pray for the friends and family of Ruby Bradley who died last week. And Father, we continue to hold John Fitzgibbons, Esther and Jonathan in prayer. So we lift them to you now and we trust in your ways in our own lives and in this world. And so we lift all of these prayers to you in your precious name. Amen.
folks, we have worshipped together. We have sat at the feet of Jesus and, and reflected on his word. We have prayed for our world. And it's now time for us to go into the world. And so just as I turn my camera around, we recognise that out that door is the world that is desperately seeking Jesus. An open door at the back of the church reminds us that we don't go out to carry on with our lives. We go out to take Jesus into the world. And so as we bless each other, look out your door. The world is waiting and God will guide your steps. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and evermore. Amen. If, you've been, if you felt this was a valuable act of worship, we invite you to share it on your own social media feeds so that others can be a part of the movement of Nutswood Methodist Church. God bless.